Hello, everybody out in the internet. Welcome to the James Murua Literary Podcast. I'm your host, James Murua. Today, I'm really excited. Uh, we've got um, two guests from across the, uh, the uh, across the world. Um, I'm broadcasting from Nairobi, Kenya, and we have Mariella in Berlin and Nyana in uh, Uganda. Uh, Nyana, would you like to introduce yourself? Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a good evening for me here. I don't know what time it is wherever you are, but I hope you're well. My name is Nyana Kakoma. I'm from Kampala right now in Uganda. I'm a publishing director and uh, the founder of So Many Stories, which started as a blog, but is now a publishing house. And we publish Ugandan authors. We run reading programs for children, book clubs, um, library for children. And uh, recently we created a word game called Ochio, which is still in line with literature and the things that we are trying to um, develop around language and fun. Yeah, that's what I do. Thank you, Mariella. Hi, hello everyone, and thanks for having me. Thank, thanks, James. It's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, and thank you to the um, to the Frankfurt Book Fair and Ursula and uh, for having me here today. I'm Mariela, and I'm here in Berlin. It's um, 7 p.m. Um, dinner time, more or less, for Germany, and uh, I'm a researcher, a consultant, a curator for children literature but I also founded uh, an international children bookstore in Berlin 13 years ago. This is where I am right now. The books that you see at the back are the books from my bookstore, international books from everywhere in the world, from Russia to the US, from Argentina to Norway. So we have books from everywhere. And um, I have this international children bookstore, but work, mainly for institutions like the Frankfurt Book Fair and festivals around the world. And I work with schools, I work with um, libraries, state libraries and projects, social, social projects in Germany and in other countries. So this is me and I hope we'll have fun in the next hour. That's a lot, huh? thank you, Mariela. Um, as she mentioned, uh, my must say thank you to our um, I must say thank you to my partners, the Frankfurter Bookmesser and the German Federal for Foreign Office for providing funding for this event. Um, let's start with you, Nyana, because a lot of people who might be streaming in, especially from the, the German side and across the, across the continent, many of them may not know a lot about the Ugandan literary community. I mean, for some of us uh, who might not know, we know about Makerere Conference, and, and maybe if you're lucky, we know somebody called Okot P. B. Tech. So would you like to give us an idea of you know, what the Ugandan publishing uh, scene looks like? Um, Bakere is a good place to start because I think that was a birthplace for many writers, like, uh, well, at least they were there. Uh, and it has grown over, over the years. Uh, I, I think uh, we may have lost Nyana for a second there. She'll be back. Uh, Mariela, maybe so. we can go to you for now. Um, oh, she's, she, she looks like she's back. Nyana, yeah, uh, you're back. back. Uh, yeah. You want to try I'm another back. game? Yes. <laughs> yes. When you think about Ugandan literature, you will, of course, think of legends like Okot Pabitek, whose literature um, is still taught in schools up to now. And uh, you might think of people like Doreen Bayingana, who um, you know, brought a prize home for her book, Tropical Fish. And um, you certainly think about FemRight, which is the Uganda Women's Association, Uganda Women Writers Association, which a lot of uh, people like me, women, started. Um, it's a space where we felt welcome. Uh, I think I started going there in my first year 
they have a resource center, a library, and you could go there and read yeah. books and meet different writers to be inspired to write. So a lot of us, especially women who have gone on to form uh, writing or literary organizations, we, you know, we had time at one point or another at, at FemRight. Um, and so you think about spaces like that, you think about spaces like uh, uh, Lantern Meet of Poets, who, who started these very cool recitals that we hadn't seen before about poetry. And then, of course, um, you must think about Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi, who is really our pride and joy at the moment, um, who is writing literature that we feel is about us in a language that um, feels it's English, but it feels very much Ugandan. I don't know if, if you get that. Um, and so in a nutshell, those are the people that, you know, you might think about Goretti Chomhendo of African Writers Trust, who puts up events that connect diaspora writers with continent writers. Um, poetry like Babi Shai Niwe Poetry. And so those are the organizations uh, that are doing one thing or another, either in poetry, in performance, or you know the novel as we know it. Publishing in Uganda, I feel, is being driven a lot by the readers. I feel that the Ugandan reader is getting more um, discerning. So they are more traveled, they can order books on Amazon. And so I feel like that alone is forcing people like myself to raise standards. We can't give substandard work, we can't just publish for the sake of it. And that's really good pressure, especially if it's coming from the audience that you're producing for. Mm -hmm. And so we are seeing a lot of publishers coming up, niche publishers. There are people who are publishing just poetry, like Chitara Nation. There are people who are publishing just self-help books, you know, from things like how to run a farm or how to start a business in Uganda. Um, how to, I saw a really big book recently just explaining the tax system in Uganda. Um, you know, things like that, that are very, very applicable to us because we do, the Ugandan reader also reads a lot of self-help books, but even if you read a book on business from America, there are certain things that can't apply to us, like, you know, um, their saving system, their national security things, they can't apply. And so it's really a joy when you see smaller niche publishing houses coming up with books that apply to us. And then um, people like myself, I just started a publishing house. Uh, I've published adults. And then along the way, I felt the need to pivot and concentrate on children's publishing. So for the next couple of years, that's what we're going to concentrate on. So I feel like the publishing industry here is now really being driven by the need. So even me for children's publishing, I just realized that no one is writing for children or making really interesting books for children or even teenagers. There's hardly any material for teenagers. And so that need is what then drove me to pivot. So I feel like it's being driven by our audience and um, the things that we want to see. It's very promising. I'm very proud of what everyone is doing. Um, it sounds like a really like an active scene right now. Um, I, um, uh, shortly, would you like to tell us how you pivoted? Because when I met you, you used to be a blogger and you've been a journalist and then you moved to being a publisher. Um, how did that happen? Yeah. So when I started the blog, um, I'd blogged since university on and off. Uh, just writing personal diaries and putting them out in the internet. <laughs> and then there's a time when I was a journalist, I wished for a space where we could write more about the arts in Uganda and not just a one pager in the Saturday paper, but like, you know, an in-depth 
um, look on at poetry and at you know who is writing and the books that are coming out and things like that usually in the dailies you get maybe half a page quarter a page and i felt like that wasn't that wasn't doing it justice also from a very selfish point of view i felt if i become a writer one day i won't be as important <laughs> because mm -hmm. nobody <laughs> nobody is paying attention um and so the idea of a blog came easy because I obviously couldn't start a daily. Um, blogging is is uh, cheaper, um, and I had done it before. And so, so many stories started like that. Along the way, I got training. African Writers Trust did training for editors. Um, and for me, that was the turning point because having worked in a newspaper, I knew how to edit nonfiction, but I didn't know how to edit fiction. How do you edit uh, something that exists in someone's head where, you know, human beings are blue and <laughs> they eat different things from what you know? Um, and so for me, I started wondering how you would work on that as opposed to nonfiction where Kampala is Kampala and it is certain kilometers away from a certain di district. So it, it's factual. And so I did that uh, writing workshop with Ella, Ella Wakatama and uh, Vimbai, the ladies who, who edited Chin 2 by Jennifer Makumbi. And at, I remember at that at that workshop, we had Ella, we had Vimbai, we had Kwani with Billy Kahora of uh, Kwani. And then we had Jennifer Makumbi at the end of that process. And so you could see physically the process of publishing a book from manuscript to the book now we were holding in our hands. And it blew my mind. I, it, it was so fascinating for me. And um, and I thought this 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 looks interesting, and and then I got a fellowship to go work with Mojaji Book in South Africa. Mojaji is a feminist publisher in South Africa. It's run by Colleen Higgs, and I think what fascinated me is we used to work in her house, and you know when someone says a publishing house, I imagined a storied building the first level of for finance and you know acquisition and <laughs> my head that's what I was doing. and that's a dream I couldn't possibly dream and then we were here and she she has published authors you know who are award winning like the one day and we were in her house and I couldn't believe it and authors would pass through, then the artists, the illustrators would come by. And it, it was just something I didn't had never experienced before. And then she took me to also other different publishing houses, children's literature, and you know, things like that. I went to bookshops, uh, I went to book launches, which were very fun. Um, and I think that's when my mind started changing because when I came back after that fellowship, I think a week later, I went and registered so many stories as a publishing, as a company, <laughs> as a publishing house. That, that, <laughs> that is quite a, that is quite a pivot. Eh? Yeah. So that's that's literally how it happened. Yeah. Uh, Maria, maybe, maybe you, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. we can bring Maria in here. Okay. Okay. For now. Um, I'm sure you've been fascinated by Nyana's story there, and um, I'm yes. In yes, and I was um, listening <laughs> and concentrated, and I want to <laughs> no, keep no, on listening. Yeah. I, I want to know from you, like, um, yeah, you're in the in the publishing space in Germany for, ch and uh, your focus is really on children. Um, maybe you can tell yeah. us a bit about the children, uh, the yeah. the German uh, children uh, scene, the, the the scene in Germany for children publishing. And, and and your and your involvement, how you got into that as well? Right. right. But maybe before I start telling you about the market and and what mm -hmm. it is it is like, maybe it is useful for you to know that I started this project thirteen years years ago, and um, 
And my main goal was to make alternative children literature more visible. And at the beginning, and because I come from Argentina, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a foreigner here. I'm not anymore, but as you know, because this feels home. But, but still, I have another perspective of what children literature is or should be, and what I read was, uh, or what I found was different from what I wanted to read. So I started this project with this main aim to convey or to to show alternative children literature. So 13 years ago, it was very difficult to find, to find it. And I'm talking only about children literature in Germany uh, because I have books from everywhere. I have books from France and I have books from Italy, from Latin America and, and from the Arabic countries. So, um, you know, it was still here in this country it was very difficult to find small publishing houses and alternative voices and more diversity uh, within the industry. So at the beginning, I had to research a lot because um, I knew there would be this, those publishers, but they are not the ones that you get advertised for. And, uh, and, um, and because I studied literature, I, was a, a cre I had a very critical, uh, or eyes on, 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 on the literature I wanted to, to find. So um, like at that time, um, I, I didn't know where to start. So I started like by going to other bookshops at that time, it was like, like Amazon was not that big. And uh, I did finally found the, the small publishing houses, like even like you know the people that that published, the, I mean they, they had like um, they made safe self publishing. Whereas today I don't even have to look for them; they are everywhere. This is the good news: diversity and um, different kinds of voices are found everywhere now. It's not only the big publishers. Um, but you find like those small publishers like round the corner and not only in Berlin, which is a big city, but also in South Germany, you have like a um, tiny publisher from Munich, um, which publishes translations from Japanese, for instance, only Japanese books. And you wouldn't find them like at that time that easily. And only in the last two years, you had like three new publishers here in Berlin uh, focused on different subjects like Jewish books or books from uh, different countries, translations into, um, into, into German. So you see the market has, has changed a lot and my role in this world, in this field, this niche, you know, I'm a niche, uh, like you are Nyana, um, uh, is like so much different now. I am more visible, of course, because I, I've been doing this work for such a long time. But I work with festivals, I, I, I work with um, institutions like, as I said before, public libraries. And, um, and, and now it's like so easy to say, oh, good, you know, like this book is from, let's say, from Egypt, uh, so you can have it in German. And it wasn't like that easy uh, 10 years ago, 13 years ago. Uh, so before, if you before ask you talk yeah. about the, the scene, uh, what has changed in the last 10 years that made it much easier for publishers to start doing this kind of work? I think, well, one of the, the main reason is probably like the whole globalization like in every country, right? So the visual language has become more universal. So picture books, I'm, I'm just talking about picture books, um, have become like more, they have like, like let's say the same language in every country, right? Because you have the differences in each country, but then you find different styles and, and then you, you know, it's easier today to work with an illustrator from Spain, let's say, and an author from Germany, things like this, right? So um, it's easier with the communication, it's, it's easier with the work. So smaller publishers can buy licenses, but they can also do co-editions. Um, co so it's much easier now. And it's also, you know, how 
the children literature is seen today in Germany. You know, Germany has a long tradition of having like many children books that are very pedagogical. And uh, it's not the same in France, for instance. And, and so there's like, you know, a, um, like, let's say the mainstream books are, have to be politically correct and, you know, like, but then in the last year, there were more publishers having like more courage and uh, they decided to just buy rights from other countries and, and just see what it happens. And many of those publishers are successful right now. I have a question, Mariela. Yeah. So let's say um, we have a book in Luganda. Luganda is one of the local languages here. Yeah. And and um, so tell me about the journey from here to your bookshop. And I'm really curious who's buying a Luganda book in Germany or is it translated along the way? Just tell me the journey that that book would, would have. Okay. Yes. I hope I can answer your questions because there are like two ways to be here. That book mm -hmm. could have like two ways. And the good news is that in the last years, there were so many good projects here in Germany to support diversity, but true diversity. You know, the, you can imagine that uh, I come from Latin America, so I have a very different background. So diversity for me is not the same probably for someone who grew up here. So yeah. true diversity um, has been institutionalized, let's say. So like there's one thing that happened like a couple of years ago and it's like very active now the government has launched a project about diversity to bring diversity in into institutions and one of the institutions that are a lot influenced by that are public libraries so what happens now is that many libraries in germany public libraries and it, not in every city but um in the major cities, they have books in foreign languages, but not just translations or books that you find in Germany, but books that are written by locals. So I'm a mm -hmm. curator for, let's say, one, two, three, three central libraries, and they have like, one of them has 35 libraries, the other one has eight libraries, and I'm a, I'm a curator for those libraries, and I see that books from different countries come there right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the people here would have those books written in other languages um and so in the first place for the community um you know it doesn't matter which community but for the the the, um, the, um, the people that you know that, that live here in germany but you know speak other languages that is like uh, the the first aim and the second one is like for germans or for schools who need to uh, research or analyze or just read books from other countries. So this would be like one way, right? To get mm -hmm. into readers through the public libraries. Not only public libraries, but also, also associations. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work on that right now. And, um, and the other thing is to get that book translated. And to get that book trans translated, I mean, there are not many publishers that would be willing to, because, you know, it's very difficult to get into uh, the German market, but it's not impossible. And there's a publisher which has, has been working on this for more than 30 years now. Um, they translate books from Asia, uh, Africa, and Latin America. Great books, not the cliche books that we 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 saw like in the past decades but books with modern stories and, and just nowadays stories and that publisher yeah. i mean it's um, um they they translate them into into german and they've been working for such a long time but now there are more uh, publishers like doing the same thing so this is the second let's say uh path to get a book into the German market uh, to mm -hmm. have it translated, which is not a, an easy way, but uh, you know these kind of events are kind of bridges to get that done. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I spoke a lot. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. I'm really, I'm really fascinated because we run a, a children's library as well. We don't have public library. We have public libraries, but there's no space for children in them. It's, um, it's a very adult space. And for researchers and really serious people, go there. <laughs> and so... We, when I started my work with children, I decided to, I was, you know, your work leads you. Eventually we started a children's library. And for me, it's interesting that you're getting books from different parts of the world, which has been extremely difficult for us in terms of um, transportation only, you know, just, yeah. just, uh, you know, after getting the huddle, over the huddle of finding the publishers, just getting the books here. There is a time, um, and we've tried to diversify our stories. You can only get English at the moment mm -hmm. because English is the nat national language here. And, uh, but we wanted as many black stories, uh, African, black, and then black stories as possible. And getting books from Nigeria, there's a time we wanted to get books from Cassava Republic. The courier was going to cost us a lot more than the books we were and the getting. Books. Yes, I know that. And so we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until, you know, I found out that Cassava Republic has an office in London and now I had to ask someone who's going to be in London next week and then send money and, you know, make, make them a book mule. And that was the easiest way. And so um, that's the method that we use now. If I hear that Mariela is going to be in Argentina, I'll, I'll send her money, she'll buy books. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't have too much luggage and then she'll bring the books for us. How is that for you as a process of getting, the other day you said I had, you had a book from Iran. How, yeah. how is that process for you? Yeah, well, you know, at the very beginning, I did exactly what you're doing because, you know, we are in a Central European country, but you couldn't find the books that I have here. Some of them, you still don't find them. So at the beginning, mm. I did that. So I went to book fairs. Um, that was like the very, very beginning. And I had to learn by doing. So I did what you say at the very beginning. Uh, the books from Iran were picked up at the uh, Frankfurt book fair or at the Bologna book fair and uh, the Paris book fair. You know, like um, I did like, you know, it was like a step by step because I wasn't big enough to get a whole container of books. Um, today it's different because I work with big institutions, but I had to start at some point and someone had to do it. So yeah. um, it's very frustrating because I still have more transport costs sometimes than the books themselves, themselves cost. But today I have the institutions, uh, at, you know, holding my back. So they yeah. are able to pay more um, for each book so that I can keep on doing this. Without the institutions, we, you know, it wouldn't be possible. And I also don't want to just have, uh, you know, elite books for a selected uh, amount of people. I want them mm -hmm. to get to, through the institutions. I want the books to get to schools and I want the books to get to libraries uh, because in that way, you just open new doors for more people, you know. Um, so I have, I still have that difficulty. I mean, this is maybe not good news for you, but I can say that I tried so many years until I found a way to keep on doing this um, yeah. at my own cost and, yeah, my own risk, let's say. Yeah, yeah. James, you're muted. <laughs> oh my god i muted myself so uh, Nyana, i wanted to i was listening to you guys so uh, keenly i forgot that i was muted and Nyana, I, I wanted to know you you mentioned that when you started that um there wasn't a huge focus on children's literature um in in uganda 
And I know that you started doing this book clubs and library. Why was the reason for that? Why did you have to start them your, uh, yourself? Okay, so there were books, right? But, uh, you know, when you talk about children's books in Uganda, the first, the biggest, the guys that are making money are textbooks. Uh, but in terms of storybooks, you know, books that children can just read for fun uh, without morals without you know without a driven agenda just for fun <laughs> those books were not were not there um but when we started the book clubs um when i started publishing for adults i realized that i was targeting a market that had already made up its mind when you're an adult you either like football or you don't um you, your habits have been formed. And so your reading habits have been formed. And I realized that we had to start at the beginning where we can still catch the attention of someone and direct them if we are to build the reading culture to start at the beginning of that process. And for many of us, like my friends who don't like reading, uh, it's really the attitude that that we were taught in school. We read to pass exams. We read for revision. We read, we read for you know serious things and not to relax and not to um, um, for fun. You didn't you didn't do that. There are very few of us, and it was because our parents were very very particular. They were either reading to us so they they encouraged reading in my home um it was my dad that encouraged me to read and so it was taken seriously if if i was seen reading a book it meant that i was doing something serious i wasn't wasting time whereas in other places, if someone saw you holding a novel, it meant that you're not a serious student because obviously you should be reading a chemistry textbook as opposed to um, a fiction book. And so for me, that realization that we were starting at the end, yet we should be starting at, you know, at the where we had a chance for real change is why we started the book clubs, but also to bring fun around reading to to just say you know just bring the kids and someone will read to those who don't know how to read the older ones nine to twelve they can read and then discuss a book and it's fun just just that <laughs> so that's why we went into the book clubs for children yeah james you're muted again <laughs> Uh, okay. How did that go? Was it successful? Was it? Um... It went really, really well. It ran from 2016. That ch so when we started, we did the children's one, the teenagers one, and the adults one. Very ambitious. <laughs> the teenagers one didn't work because a lot of teenagers were in boarding school. So you either partnered with a school, and because we were small, we couldn't spread ourselves to different schools. The adults one worked um, a bit, but um, it didn't. It didn't really take. Uh, you know, people got busy. They have to work, and um, they would show up without having read the book. And then you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, book club, the book club is for the books. <laughs> <laughs> there is a social aspect of it, but the <laughs> book is really the, for, the forefront of this. And so, you know, you start to see the thing, your vision changing, and it's becoming just a social club and a hangout. And yeah, but the children, um, I think it was the children that convinced parents because children would come. And then when they leave, they ask their parents, when is the next one? We used to have it once a month. When is the next one? When are we doing? And we really tried to make it fun. Each month had a theme. So if it was about farm animals, every age group, so we divide them four to six, seven to nine, and 10 to 12. Every age, 
age group had something about uh, animals and we had crafts at the end of it all and they had a snack because children need to be fed. Um, you know, so we tried to make it as fun as possible. And so it became word of mouth. Someone would come with six children because they've come with the neighbor's children because the kids went to the neighbors and said, we went to this place where, you know, this person read to us. And then the other thing that made it successful is as it was growing bigger, my I didn't have a big staff. So I called people to volunteer. And by last year, we had about 55 volunteers, which used to blow my mind because these people would set aside time. The only thing we'd give them is breakfast, really. But they would mm -hmm. set aside time and come and read to the kids. And the kids would get attached and they'd go, oh, uncle so-and-so, teacher so-and-so. <laughs> and, and, you know, we would... It was fun, but we would evaluate, you know, each group had a reader and an evaluator. So you'd be able to watch and see a child who's struggling, a child who doesn't participate, a child who, you know, um, finds, because we would have also read alouds. Somewhere, a child who hesitates over words and then would give that feedback to parents. So a lot of parents were able to see that it was growing their children. And then, you know, children would have spelling bees and the parents send us the reviews and they're like, oh my God, the kids are reading better. So I, it, it grew organically. And um, we took a break in December last year and we were meant to come back in March. Usually we take a break around that time just to plan and do all that. And then COVID happened. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened. But it was it's one of the successful things we've done as so many stories. I think also for me, the thing with working with children is you get to see the change. You get you get to see them change. You get them, you see them have aha moments and they're not like adults trying to not look stupid or, you know, serious. When an aha moment happens, a child will say, oh my God, I didn't understand that at the beginning of the book and now I understand. And you actually see change and the work that you're doing. It's very refreshing, even when you're tired. It's it's really amazing when you work with children, yeah. Mariela, have you had any experience with this uh, this kind of experience yourself in the work you've been doing? I was, I was laughing the whole time because at the very beginning, I started like you, Niana. I had a book lab here, and, and because it was in many languages, uh, the idea was to get people from different languages all together. So sometimes, um, it was not the books that brought us together, but maybe music. We had music courses and, and because the idea was to get them together in the first place, different mm -hmm. communities. We had, uh, we, we had the Italian ones, we had Hebrew people, we had um, people that spoke Farsi here. And uh, this is how I started. I mean, they're different context, completely different, but also with the aim of getting people who would not get together yeah. Um, getting together. Do you know what I mean? So, and and what I um, I was listening carefully to you because uh, I always thought that we should offer literature for pleasure, not to educate. And I was like always like uh, you know like um, I had this flag with me. No, do not try to find a book just because it's got a message. Just you know, we have to read literature. We have to bring good stories if we don't have like a good story now because we don't have like the book we we can also go you know to oral storytelling uh, Yana is gone oh you're back no, I'm, here. I'm here yeah, i'm here <laughs> ah, yeah. okay sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry um so at the beginning i i started very little now i do the same but in bigger, um, in a bigger scale, because I work with festivals and I organize events with schools. But uh, but you know, at the end, it's the same because you bring your enthusiasm, and if you don't have enough money to do it, because let me tell you, you know, we we are in Europe and and we are in Germany, but sometimes the alternative cultural program 
have no funding. So sometimes you just, if you don't get the funding, and, and this is, you know, this is what I do because I come from Argentina and I know what it is like, I just do it. I just try to find a way. So, you know, with festivals, it's sometimes the same. You, you, want, you want to work with a school, but uh, it's difficult because it's A, B, C, and then, but maybe you find D and then you do it. And, um, yeah. and this was my experience, like yours, um, with, you know, working with children, working, and now working with teachers as well. Sometimes I have to convince them um, why we should take books which apparently are not for kids, you know, mm -hmm. and still experiment a bit and still give mm -hmm. it a chance. And, you know, you just bring your enthusiasm. And, yeah, sometimes it's very frustrating because you don't get the results you want. But uh, most of the times it's, you know, you breathe um, this good energy that comes out of it. What you say, Mariana? Yeah. Um, Mariana, I want to go back to you. Um, uh I know you've been, you know, you've been experimenting. You've been bringing new books. You've been doing new things, but I know that you're, you've been at the center of, you know, you've been. I do remember for the Bologna Ragazzi Award and um, National Children's uh, Literature Award in Germany. Um, please tell us about this process. I mean, um, I, I have judged awards, but for me, judging awards for children is a is a very interesting concept. Would you like to tell us, get us through how that works? Yeah. Well, there were very different processes because in the meantime, I was also, I, would, yeah, I was like this year, I was in the, in the um, jury for the uh, Chinese Picture Book Award. So you can imagine what that experience was to me without knowing that much about China, but knowing a lot mm. about picture books. So every experience is different. And uh, when I got this invitation uh, from Bologna, I thought they they sent it to the wrong person because I didn't even know that they knew that I existed, you know, um, because I do these tiny jobs and I always concentrate a lot on the projects and I, I am not too much concentrated on the, let's say, marketing, right? So I, I didn't know how they got my name. So it was like a, a, like a huge door for me to see 1,500 books in four days with these amazing people, this amazing jury. And we were all different. I was an expert on picture books. Uh, there was a journalist there. There was a graphic designer. There was an, someone um, from a library in Denmark. So we were all very different. And we had, we all had like different views and from different countries. So this is to just, you just get out of that, like, um, you know, with like richer, let's say, no money, but, but with, uh, with much more experience. Whereas the, the German um, being at the, um, at the jury for the national um, award in Germany, uh, it was a longer process. The other one was four days. This was a whole year reading books and for teenagers, um, getting, I mean, like deep into the German language and German literature and understanding. So all these processes are learning processes. And I feel like more and more humble with the work I do because I, I believe that children literature can really change um, a whole society, a whole generation. So if you find the right channels, um, like, you know, an award, and you, you just, you influence something at the beginning. You don't know in the long term. And, and now the Chinese competition and, and the world, we were like, um, we were three international people, like from different countries and, and two Chinese um, uh, people. And that was, uh, again, you know the Chinese had translators, and uh, and we first had to 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 listen to to the people and in Chinese, and then the translator, and you see the views of you know how they see children literature in a country which is so far away from my culture, um, from the German culture, and again, come to the same point. It's so important to work in this field. Um, even if it's sometimes underestimated, you know, in the cultural world. 
Um, I mean, seeing, seeing as you've read quite a bit of uh, books in the last uh, year, um, would you like to give us some a few names of some writers from uh, children's writing that we want to be checking out as, you know, either for ourselves or for our kids? Uh, maybe two or three names. And if you have any names from the African space, I'd be very interested. African or Black space. Yes, yes. I have, uh, I don't know if you, if you know Kilaka. The name? Hold on. I, I don't see, know. Uh, see he, can you see, hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I you're seeing the name? <laughs> I seem to have an issue here, sorry. Um, you know John Kilaka from Tanzania? Uh, I don't know the name, but I will now know. <laughs> I love yeah. his books. I love his books. And uh, this, uh, this is, it's got like colorful paintings and his stories are so lively. And uh, I remember like also we truly books from um, from one of the uh, African uh, countries I recommend him and mm -hmm. um, the same publisher has uh, other books from from Africa like a collection of um, st short stories from Cameroon uh, the publisher is called Baobab you can check that and um, but also you know work with French publishers I've heard um, of Baobab Baobab, you know them, mm. Nyana? I've, I've heard, heard of them, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they, um, they have, for me, they have like the best books with the best voices, let's say, because it, take, it takes them so long to find the authors and illustrators that at the end, they, I, I just think they choose like the good ones. So you can check that and, um, and, and the whole catalog because they have like many different um, uh, books. Also for um, teenagers, like uh, they published Bom Dia Camaradas, you know that book? I can't pronounce the name. Yes, you had the author um, in, one of this, the, um, in one of the meetings. Yeah, I cannot pronounce his name, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, it's a book Jackie. from Angola, yes. From Jackie. Angola, yes. Yes, I love oh, that yes. book. I'm... Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. Okay, you can check that. Maybe it's enough. I'm, I'm, uh, again, I think that those are enough. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. So, yeah. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to jump in here. Okay. It's a it's a COVID year. Um, how has uh, how have you been able to you know cope with the year of lockdown have you done any innovations have you done any interesting things to go around um, um you know maybe you can start with how has the lockdown has been for your country and how it's affected your 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 space i think we got yeah. we lost yana yana Hello. Okay, I, I can't hear Nyana. Um, I'll just ask you, Mariela, as we, we try and get Nyana back. Um, your bookstore is called oh. Mundo Azul. Yeah. Oh, Nyana is back. Nyana I'm is back. back. Oh, yes. <laughs> You're back. Yes. Thank God. Yeah. So I'm, I just want to know how your, your year has been, you know, coping with lockdowns. How has it affected? you know, the work that you do and what, how have you been able to go around it? Yeah. Um, James, you should check her bookstore on Instagram. It's really pretty. Your bookstore? Uh, Mariela's bookstore on Instagram. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I, I, I know that one. <laughs> I followed it well, but... <laughs> ah, thank you. Yeah, it's Mundo That's Azul, how I spent my day. I spent my day just scrolling and just seeing and you know, picking so ideas. Much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when we started the library, it was a physical location. It was in a certain part of Kampala. 
and we would have people come in and go bring their children, read to them. We wouldn't lend at that time. Um, but towards the end of 2019, I started realizing that it wasn't working. First, the traffic, the number of kids were few. And, um, you know, there are certain things you realize when you've already started the business. It was in a certain part of town that wasn't accessible to, you know, people if you didn't have a car or you didn't have uh, you, personal transport, it became difficult. And so we started reevaluating what do we do? What do we do with the library? Because it's also very terrible when you have 600 titles and you're looking at them and no one is reading them. Um, but also the idea of only being able to reach a certain kind of child who, who has certain privileges was very disturbing for me. And so we started thinking about it. Uh, in December, we started testing a mobile library. One of our main types of transport here, uh, Mariela, is called Border Border, which is a motorbike. You can sit on it and you'll be transported from place to place. Uh, you beat traffic. It's very efficient. Uh, the way you have a plumber and you have a, a, a water person or an electrician or someone who comes to fix things at home, every one of us almost has a border guy who you can call at any time to pick you. You can send to the market if you run out of spices and things like that <laughs> for a quick delivery. And so we started looking at that. What if I send books to Mariela, who's at home, for her children and then she's uh, the next time when i'm picking those books we send a fresh batch of books so we started testing it out there was a parent who was homeschooling her, her boys and um and i think they don't they didn't have a car and so they would only come in a few times yet they loved coming and so we started testing with the people we knew so, of course, when COVID hit, it became very obvious what we had to do. And at that time, we had about maybe five children. We were testing out, just seeing how it would work. And with COVID, they locked down schools, kids were not going. And so we started advertising, reaching out to our book club parents, telling them about it. Um, and now we have about 70 children that we deliver books to every every two weeks so you spend two weeks with the books and as we come to to drop a fresh batch we pick the old ones uh we put them in a certain area so that they can uh we give them 14 days so that they are safe again to be taken so the books that come from james's home cannot come directly to my home because of covid um uh but we've been I think for me, my biggest fear at that time was the destruction of the books, you know. <laughs> we we didn't know how it was going to work out. But the kids have been, I think we've had two or three damages. Um, there are parents we have who, so when, should, when the, the schools locked down, there are schools that continued with online learning, but those schools are mostly very, very privileged schools, uh, privileged parents. The normal Ugandan child cannot be in those schools. And so we found parents who've told us that the only learning that children have been getting is what the library has been offering, uh, wow. because that's what they can afford compared to you know, online learning. And also children have been a lot on, you know, watching Zoom classes, Microsoft Teams and things like that. And so even those ones, it has been refreshing for them to switch off a laptop and be able to read a book. Uh, and so it has worked both ways. So of all the projects that we run at So Many Stories, the library is the one that thrived the most during uh, the lockdown because we could reach children, children write to us and say, oh, I liked this book. Can I get another book in the same series? 
They send us, you know, pictures that they've drawn from the books, how they've reimagined. So it 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 felt important, and also that we were, um, I don't know, getting feedback from the people you're sending. Like you feel I've not met these kids, I don't know them, and yet I know them <laughs> because <laughs> they've sent letters, they've told us what we like they've requested for books. So if we didn't have a certain book, we were able now to go and look for them and find them. So that's the one that made us rethink how we were working. And right now we are working on a platform where parents can log in, order the books that they want, and it comes to us directly. At the moment, we you know, use different so if I know that a child is five years old, I use that direction to choose books for them. But the platform, the new platform will be that the parent can sign in, like an Amazon, but for library. And they mm. order the books that they need and they come to us and we just pack them and, and send them because parents requested that they're involved in the selection of the books. I think that's the one that has, uh, that I've been most proud of and, um, it's the one we were able to pivot really quickly and and serve and serve uh, at a time when we had no idea what was happening. Yeah. Wow, this is really impressive. Really, really impressive. Uh, Mariela, how have you been? Uh, how have you been um, coping with the lockdowns mm -hmm. and COVID? How what have you done differently this year? Well, the first thing I had to learn is to get along with all this technology because that was the only way i had to you know keep on communicating being communicated with uh, with people but uh, but before i tell you that i wanted to say because i'm just uh, i was like imagining what nyana is doing and i was dreaming a little bit like with you know the bike motorbike and you know <laughs> and uh, and i love what you I, I just let me tell you that i come from a a very tiny city from North Argentina. It's actually the poorest part of the country, and people are very creative as well. They they don't you know it's like uh, and I have I come from this part of the country, not from the big cities. And and I heard of so many stories during this time, like yours, uh, that uh, I immediately like traveled. <laughs> you know, to Kamala. So congratulations on that because it's uh, it's very difficult to keep on. Um, uh, being enthusiastic with all of this. And as for me, um, as I said, uh, I, ha I just had to to switch and, and turn into this new technology and talk to people because I talk to people from everywhere in the world. Uh, so what is different now and what is really good is that um, I, I could make like more people more visible during this time. Uh, I work for the Frankfurt Book Fair and many people couldn't come this year. Uh, mm -hmm. So I invited them online. So we had so many great speakers and we could feature publishers from, um, from Lebanon, for instance. And, you know, it, it's, um, it's such a new discovery because the rest of my work, it was like between physical and, and, and online. I also work with a literature festival in Berlin. So we, we still went to schools with limited a, a, a number of, of students, but we still did our workshops. But the most amazing thing was like this screen that I have here made me find uh, people who do like, you know, I'm meeting you now and I didn't know anything from you <laughs> until a month ago when Ursula invited me to this. So I research on James' blog, and now I learn about um, Jana. So this was the most amaz amazing thing that happened to me, that I had access to people that I wouldn't have known otherwise. And many people don't make it to the book fairs. It's very expensive, and, uh, you know, and, um, and this year it would have been like, you know, it would have been an, another book fair, but uh, if, it if, if, it, if we didn't have COVID, but we had this, so um, I was very excited about it. Yeah. yeah. What this, about this your really your bookshop, your bookstore? Um, did you have to close it? Are you open now? What happened yes. with that? 
yes, we're open now. But mm -hmm. Nyana, you have to, maybe you have to know that my bookstore, it's just a physical place, but I hate mm -hmm. just being here the whole time. So I take mm -hmm. my suitcase and I go to places with my books. So I teach to teachers, I teach to kindergarten teachers, I, I give workshops to different kinds of people. So I always go out because uh, yeah. otherwise, you know, um, I cannot just wait for people to come and see like these difficult uh, books somehow. So mm -hmm. that wasn't different for me because it was closed for a month, but I was still able to do that, to come out with my books and, um, and you know, to bring that to people. So I've been doing that for many years, so it wasn't different. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And yeah, we've been doing this for now, so maybe we should be thinking about wrapping up. It doesn't seem like <laughs> has it been um, an hour? <laughs> it's already been an hour. <laughs> so what I'm going to oh ask God. you is, um, yeah, I'm going to ask you, um, apart from uh, your new technology, which you're trying to, you're, you're trying to build a platform. Um, what is the future for so many stories um, going forward? You know, it can be right now or post COVID. Where, where do you where do you think you're going in the future? Um, I think I would really love to bring back the book clubs, and that's one of the immediate things we are working on for next year. Maybe they would have to be virtual, or um, yeah. Then currently we are running a fundraiser for the library to buy more books so that children who can you know the the membership for the library is little money but it's still a lot of money for a lot of people who have lost jobs and um and, and it's still difficult you know if you have to make a choice between food and a library membership for your child it's still food will win mm -hmm. so we want to reach another ch kind of child who has no online, who has no private tutor, who has no, um, who hasn't gone to school for these past eight months. And so the fundraiser, by helping us get more books, we can reach more children. So that's one of the things that we are working on as well. Um, um, do you mind uh, telling us, uh, do you mind, uh, if somebody wants to help with that, how, how do they get a hold of you? Um, we you can check on our social media it's called book my dream the book my dream campaign um it's also on on our website um yeah so the campaign is called book book my dream um i'm really looking forward to doing books for teenagers i feel like no one really thinks about teenagers when they're writing they're you know either children or adults and yet i feel in when you're a teenager that's when you're deciding certain things about your preferences and things like that so i look forward to publishing for for teenagers fun you know books for teenagers and uh, translations English in Uganda is our national language, but uh, in school for the past for the first four years you study in a local language. So I would want to be able to contribute to that. Um, also, just for preservation of our languages, that's one of the things I'm very keen on. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I wanted to say something. Thank you so much, uh, Nyana. Mariela, what is your yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, but because we have to finish. But I wanted to say something to Nyana. Um, you know, if you if you keep on working, you will always find partners willing to help. And um, and it's not only like a conventional and library, maybe what you're looking for, but there are many other ways to build up a library today. And this is maybe interesting for you if you want to reach like you know all kinds of audiences. So maybe we can keep in touch and and we can yeah. exchange contacts and, and ideas this is yeah for sure. yeah yeah yes so mariella what is your, your what are your plans for the future my plan for the future is to work less <laughs> 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 that's a wrong answer 
<laughs> yeah, because of, I, you know, I'm almost 50 now and uh, I, I do so, you know, you heard so many stories and I do everything on my own. So I, I do have like a couple of people here, but they just a few hours. Uh, my project is an independent project and I'm always like trying to survive financially. So I want to work less. I hope I can achieve that. But uh, all the less next year, uh, we are planning, I am planning to go to Mexico to, for a project. And um, I hope I can make it to Lithuania again, because there's a residency for illustrators there. And I do all these things, you know, like small projects and bigger projects. And uh, yeah, I hope I can keep on doing this. And but and less healthy. work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Mariela. Thank you so much, Diana. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us on the live stream, for those who showed up. I'd like to thank my partners, Frankfurter Bookmaster. Thank you so much, Ursula. You've been very, very, you've been a star. And of course, I'd like to thank the German Forum Federal of Foreign Office for providing funding for this event. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please read children's literature, read your book kids, and I'm sure they, they will change for the better for now and in the future. Uh, thank you, Mariela. Thank you, Jana. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. This Goodbye. Was so fun. Thank, Thank you, James. It was a pleasure. Thank you.